Okay. Welcome everybody to the October edition of the University of Low Bronx meeting. Sorry for a little delay here as I was explaining, we had a few technical difficulties, but I think we're good now. So, uh, uh, and of course, we are the University of Lowbrow Astronomers. Uh, and just so that everybody knows, after we get down with this, we are going to upload the recording to YouTube. So we have to be on our best behavior. But anyway, uh, as usual, we'll have our guest speaker tonight first and then run an officer's meeting uh, after that, or, you know, business meeting. And our speaker tonight is Alina Gallo. And Professor Gallo earned her, both her Bachelor of Science in Physics and her Master's of Science in Astrophysics from the University of Milan, Italy, and her PhD in Astronomy from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Elena is also a Chandra Fellow at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a Hubble Fellow at MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research. Today, we are privileged to have her right here at the U of M Astronomy Department, where she teaches extreme astrophysics. And we do like extreme, don't we? <laughs> Dr. Gallo's primary field of research is observational high energy astrophysics with a focus on the properties of accreting black holes, the production of relativistic outflows as a source of energy input into the interstellar medium, and the origin and occurrence of supermassive black holes and galactic nuclei. More recently, she became interested in the effects of high energy stellar irradiation in the context of atmospheric escape from exoplanets. Since 2019, she has been serving on the Senate Advisory Committee on the University Affairs, the executive arm of the University of Michigan Senate and the Senate Assembly. Tonight, we're honored to have Professor Gallo here with us to talk about some of her research, what she has learned as she teaches it, with a presentation titled, Seeing and Hearing Black Holes, Big and Small. So with that, let's please welcome Professor Lena Gallo. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It's long due, the first invitation I got uh, you know, was prior to COVID and had to bail out. So I'm glad to finally, finally be able to be here and to be able to give this talk in person. There really is a difference when you can look at yeah. people in the eye. So um, I hope I'm not going to offend anyone's intellect tonight. I'm not going to give an extra technical presentation. Um, what I thought I'd be doing is to share with you a number of relatively recent results in the field of quote unquote observational black hole astrophysics um, that I would say something like only five years ago, I would not have been able to share. So some of these is really the latest and it's been enabled by major progress, progresses in technology, as well as observational upgrades to existing facilities and new exciting facilities coming online. I will end with a brief summary um, of what are the next generation observational facilities that will enable further discoveries in this in these. Uh, is the audio okay? Can someone signal um, whether you're able to hear? Okay, I see thumbs up, so I'll keep going. Uh, also, please feel free to interrupt during the talk at any time if you have questions. This is very informal. Hope that's okay. So I'll start, well, I lied. I said I'll start with very recent uh, results, but I actually uh, want to start with a little bit of history, if I can advance the slides. But uh, and, you know, just to set the ground, this is probably stuff you are familiar with, but uh, as a refresher, um, a big revolution in our understanding and interpretation of astrophysical phenomena came a little over a century ago when Einstein published the general theory of relativity. So in essence, 
my way of ascribing general relativity to you know, 100 level astronomy class uh, students is in these two sentences. Gravity as seen by Einstein in contrast to the Newtonian approach is no longer a force that acts between bodies. It becomes a property of space-time itself, a property of the four-dimensional, three spatial dimension plus time, which is somewhat hard to grasp in its entirety, but can be relatively easily visualized in two dimensions by imagining space-time as a rubber fold of two dimensions that can be curved by the presence of mass and energy because they become one in the Einstein uh, theory. So energy and mass bend space-time and in turn, current space-time tells masses and light how to move. This is the revolution that was set up in 1950. So back then, it belonged to the textbook. It belonged to Einstein's papers that were first published uh, by the Prussian, the German Academy of Sciences. This was, you know, World War One. Uh, it was a hard time even in terms of communication. Some well-known astronomers back in the UK got their hands on those papers and studied them and realized there were implications, there were predictions that this theory made that could be tested. And so they set off, and I'm sure you're familiar with where I'm going, to test one of the many crucial predictions of the theory, which is the bending of light. That the presence of a mass induces a curvature in the fabric of space-time, and said curved space-time will force light to move along a different trajectory than it would otherwise in the absence of that mass. You don't need a black hole for this. Any mass can do it ever so slightly. And so Eddington, that probably familiar with, soon realized that the upcoming solar eclipse in 1919 gave physicists and astronomers all over the world an opportunity to test the theory. So the idea was that the total eclipse during the total obscuration of the sun from where you could see it. And in 1919, you had to go to Brazil or Northwest Africa to actually see the total eclipse, that during obscuration, you would be able to see stars in the vicinity of the disk of the sun that you would not be able to see when the sun is shining, just because it would overshine those stars. And that, if in the absence of an object such as the sun that bends ever so slightly space time, you would observe a star in a given direction. So this would be the projection, the extension of this trajectory in a linear fashion. So that would be a flat space time absence of curvature. During an eclipse, you would see that object at a different position, a different apparent position where the shift is induced, would be induced by the bending of space-time through the mass of the sun. So by measuring this shift and comparing the position of some stars in the Hyades cluster, okay, in the Taurus constellation, these astronomers set out two groups, one dispatched to Brazil, one to Northwest Africa, to test Einstein's theory of general relativity. The result is well known. Uh, just for reference, this image is not an original image. 
of the eclipse. This is obviously a high quality digitalized image, but it, it's actually being obtained by you know, applying modern techniques to the original plates, the photographs that were taken in Brazil in May 1919. And indeed, so the, the, the weather and some other difficulties prevented a reliable measurement from West Africa, but the one that was made in Brazil was sufficient to prove the theory correct. And so this is a copy of the dispatch, the telegram that went out to the New York Times in November 1919, by the time they had come back and done the analysis of their data. So this was the first test, the first test that the general theory of relativity passed. Um, the second, and the reason why I'm mentioning this, I will actually come back to some of these notions, some of these experiments, if you will, uh, in the context of black hole astrophysics. So the second test in it that Einstein passed with you know, flying colors was the ability of the theory to explain the insofar unexplained precession of the perihelion of Mercury. Mercury being the closest planet to the sun in the solar system is the one that sits, sits deeper into the gravitational potential well of the sun and therefore experiences space-time curvature the most. And so the known precession of the perihelion in the orbit of Mercury of approximately 43 arc seconds per century is fully explained by general relativity by stating that in curved space-time, unlike flat space-time, elliptical orbit cannot be closed. Okay? They have to be open in the precession. You can actually explain this even to a five-year-old by taking a flat piece of paper, drawing an ellipse, and you take scissors, you draw out a pie, you cut out a pie of the, of the paper, and then you show that you know, once space-time becomes curves, you can no longer draw the ellipse in a false fashion as you could before. And so second test, and we'll get back here uh, to this uh, when it comes to the black hole. And then the third test that came later in the 60s, in the late 60s, these followed the discovery of pulsars in the early 60s by Jocelyn Bell Burnell, Cambridge. So neutron stars are probably familiar with what they are. They are the collapsed core of a very massive star. Um, they have the size of a small city, perhaps 10, 12 kilometers in radius, and the mass of a star, one and a half times the mass of the star, right? So you take two objects that are already that extreme, the mass of a star within the radius of a small city, and you make them orbit around each other, or better around their common center of mass, with a period of less than eight hours, meaning that the separation, the orbits are ecliptic, the separation, the minimum separation between them when they get closest is about one solar radius. So this is very extreme. These objects, if Newton were to tell the story, would keep orbiting each other at very high velocities for as long as the age of the universe. So in other words, what you're looking at on the right-hand side, if I were to draw a prediction in Newtonian relativity, Newtonian Lorentzian relativity, as a function of time, I want, if I wanted to plot any changes in the orbital period of these two pulses, this would be my model, a perfectly flat line. There's no noticeable, no measurable change in the orbit over a timeline of 30 years, say. However, turn to general relativity. And the prediction from the model is that the orbit will shrink 
progressively, the period will get shorter. And this is a by how much in seconds. So at the level of 30 to 40 seconds over a period of about 30 years. And notice these red points are the actual data, the measurement. So again, just to be clear, this line is not a fit to the data. That is the theory as written by Einstein. Mm -hmm. Why are they, why is the orbit shrinking? Why is the system losing orbital energy? This is a purely general relativistic effect. And it has to do with the fact that these two objects are very compact and are moving, generating asymmetries in their mass distribution, thereby emitting gravitational waves. They're losing energy by sending a small fraction of their own rest mass energy in the form of ripples through space and time. And again, the theory is tested to high precision and meant to work. I will come back to this notion of gravitational waves and what we can do today, not some 20 years later yet, with these concepts. So this is the past, in a sense, just to set the stage for the general theory of relativity where black holes are, <clears throat> going back to you know, the early 1900s, um, something that belongs to the textbooks. So this curvature of space and time that is generated by any mass, even yourself, we generate a small curvature in the fabric of space time. Okay? It is most extreme in the presence of highly compact objects, particularly dead stars such as white dwarfs, this is essentially what the sun and all the stars like it will turn into once they run out of fuel. They have the mass of about a solar mass and the size of Earth, so incredibly high densities. Even more extreme objects such as neutron stars, which have again the mass of a small star but the size of a small city, and thus a very strong curvature in the fabric of space-time. But the most extreme curvature is induced by objects we call black holes, effectively achieved when the gravitational collapse of, say, the core of a very massive stars cannot be stopped by any form of outward pressure that can withstand that level of inward pull. So one prediction would be when the a star that is born 30, 40, or 50 times more massive than the sun ends its life, runs through all the chains of thermonuclear reactions all the way to iron, beyond which you can no longer generate energy via fusion or fission. Gravity takes over and nothing can stop it. The result is a singularity, a space-time singularity, which induces infinite curvature in the fabric of space-time. From the outside observer point of view, these objects is essentially defined by some imaginary radius or a collection of radii. There is a famous cluster or circular orbit or better yet the event horizon of the whole, which is this distance, if you will, from the singularity, from which not even light can escape. In other words, if you write down the expression for the escape velocity, which you can because you have a certain amount of gravity within a certain amount of space, uh, that is equal to the speed of light. Nothing travels faster than light. Nothing can escape from within the horizon singularity. Uh, with a series of very interesting and exotic effects to do with time dilation and length contraction that come with the whole package of relativity. So the notion that if you were to fall into a black hole, 
the famous astronaut who's falling into the black hole, who is shining a torch at the outside astronaut who is sitting in a spaceship looking at, uh, uh, at the astronaut falling in. What we would see, what the other astronaut would see is these, the falling one in the process of falling forever. As in the time as measured from the outside approaches infinity because there is a gravitational relativistic time dilation and all sorts of aspects, but I won't go into that. News is black holes exist. We found them, many of them, hundreds of them, probably there's hundreds of thousands of them. Probably there is one large black hole in every single galaxy out there. And on top of that, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of small stellar sized black holes scattered throughout the galaxy. They're the remnants of very massive stars that have died. So this little uh, sketch here illustrates specific known examples of astrophysical black holes ranging from the record holder OJ287. This is thought to weigh a total of 18 billion times the mass of the sun, all the way down to a so-called standard mass black hole, this is Cygnus X1 in the Milky Way galaxy. This is the result of most likely the gravitational collapse of a very massive star, which has left behind a 20 solar mass black hole that is orbiting around another normal, quote unquote, O-type, very luminous, very massive star. And all the way in between, okay? This one, I'm sure you know, M87, is a relatively speaking nearby very massive black hole, six billion solar masses sitting at the center of a very massive, quiet, non-star forming elliptical galaxy. Okay. So guys, the 20 solar mass black holes that come from the death of massive stars, we understand fairly well how to make them and how to look at them. These guys are very common, probably. One of them is at the center of every galaxy. The larger the galaxy, the larger the black hole. We don't know yet how they were formed. So moving on, how do we see them? I said, we know they exist. How do you go and find something whose defining property is not even light and escape from it? It's almost an oxymoron, right? So certainly black holes do not emit light in their own right. Hawking radiation aside, which is a phenomenon that would not be visible with any of the telescopes that we have and not even those that we can dream of. So what I look for is the influence of the black hole on its surrounding. And we look for typically light electromagnetic emission of two kinds. So the first examples, the, the first example um, that comes to mind is sort of represented here by this quite, um, uh, by this metaphor in a sense, which is thought to uh, indicate how in the presence of a black hole, when you have very strong gravity and infinite space-time curvature, becomes the most powerful force you can think of. So how do you turn gravity into a, a power central in a sense? Well, the same way on Earth, you use hydraulic power, you know, to you use the gravitational, um, the release of gravitational potential energy of water from a certain height to down to a lower height to generate mechanical energy to then generate electric energy. Well, in the presence of a black hole, that same process, converting gravitational potential energy of the matter that is falling in, becomes extremely efficient, far more efficient, not that just on Earth, but far more efficient 
than nuclear fusion in the core of stars. The efficiency of nuclear fusion is not even 1%. Not even 1% of the rest mass energy of your hydrogen will go into radiation. 0.08%. That's the efficiency. Here, if you have a supermassive black hole, the efficiency of conversion of gravitational potential energy to radiation can approach 40%, which means if you throw an apple into a black hole, you get out the same power as a nuclear device. So matter becomes extremely hot and therefore extremely fast around black holes. That's what we look for hot matter in the form of ultraviolet, X ray, radiation, et cetera. Supermassive black holes were discovered back in the 60s. A young astronomer by the name of Martin Schmidt had access to the 20 inch Palomar telescope in California and started to use it. And um, for the first time, was able to measure the spectrum of one of these objects that were classified as quasars, quasi-stellar radio object or QSO, quasi-stellar objects. So things that were known for, but nobody really know what to make of them. Um, as the name says, they looked kind of like a star, but not really, there was some fuzziness around them. And that was about it. So Schmidt is able to take a spectrum and identify H alpha, H rest, some specific atomic transitions arising from one of these guys. It recognizes them as such and measures the redshift, measures the shift in wavelength that arises from the fact that, and that was well known by then, the galaxies are moving away from each other, that the universe is expanding. The problem was, or the shocking thing was, he realized that this guy here was something like 20 billion light years away and more powerful, more luminous than something like our own galaxy times a million times. So then the most physical interpretation for this without coming up with completely new physics is you need something that's far more efficient than stars to power this, and therefore accretion onto a supermassive black hole. That's the beginning of it. Now we'll go a little bit closer to home. This is a sketch of a spiral galaxy, such as the Milky Way. If you could draw it and put it you know, at an angle, uh, edge on. You'll have this bulge of old stars and then a relatively well-defined disk of younger stars where there's still a little bit of star formation. Um, the solar system is located pretty much in the outskirts. So the distance between the center of the galaxy and ourselves, the solar system is about 25,000 light years. And us, as, as about everything else, is orbiting around the center of the galaxy at approximately 250 kilometers per second. And um, we would like to know what's down there, right? So astronomers have been looking <laughs> for uh, evidence of exotic objects in the center of the galaxy for a long time, hence we're there. Problem is, as you know very well, I'm sure, there is, um, there's a lot of stuff between us and the center of the galaxy. Particularly, there's a lot of dust, which is nasty, which is nasty because it does really well at absorbing all the optical radiation that comes from the center of the galaxy. So it's better to move towards uh, lower energies in the infrared. Not, it's, a, it's not without problems, but thanks to phenomenal, phenomenal progress in the 
optical and infrared technology. You're seeing here the full glory of the very large telescope interferometer, the instrument known as gravity. This is operated by ESO, the European Southern Observatory in Chile, and consists of four telescopes that are working in concert to synthesize the light that they're seeing. And they're using laser guided adaptive optics to correct the response of the mirror to uh, weed out turbulence in the sky, everything that's moving and distorted in the sun, you know, and recover the highest possible spatial resolution that we can achieve from the ground. This instrument, the VLT, has been working for the last more than 20 years now in competition, sometimes friendly, sometimes less so, with the UCLA Galactic Center Group, which is levering, leveraging similar technology with the CAC telescopes uh, in, on Mauna Kea and Hawaii. And the two groups have been kind of competing with each other, outdoing each other results to show evidence for what we now think is a four, 4.3 million solar mass in the center of our own galaxy. So I have now here <clears throat> pretty video that was put together it's a PR video at ESO that is worth looking at. And it's a collage, a montage of images, the actual astronomical images, not hard this impression, of this travel through the Milky Way galaxy, zooming in to Sagittarius A star, a rather inconspicuous radio source, which had been known for a long time, that sits right at the center of our own galaxy. Who's your money on? Which group? <laughs> this is now a movie that puts together data taken over several years, all those little moving blobs that you're looking at are stars that look quite unimpressive until you actually look at the timeline and the velocity they're moving at. This is the latest results published by the Gravity Collaboration which has actually been able to confirm the trajectory of a new star S29, as well as discover a couple new stars that were not known prior. Just for reference, you're looking at the position of Sagittarius A star, the center of the galaxy. This is the closest approach orbit of S29. And this little thing here, is the size of Neptune's orbit. This is as good as it gets. Now, um, this is a very recent result. Gravity has been used, has been able to uh, surpass Keck in a sense through the interferometry and obtain a, a very major result that I will, <clears throat> I will uh, talk about in a minute. But what I wanted to do to, um, to give credit where credit is due is to show you, now this movie, let me pause a second. This is the same idea, collection of stars, the same stars, these are not different stars, that have been tracked now with the CAC telescope by um, the Galactic Center group at UC Los Angeles, led by Andrea Guess. And the reason why I'm showing you this is that because observations taken over you know, several years, we're able for the first time to identify the orbit of a specific star called SO2, you will see it, 
and track the entire orbit of the stars. 18 years of going up to the telescope regularly, every month, every couple of months, and take high quality data to do this amazing astronomy experiment. So this cross marks the position of Sagittarius A star. Now we're zooming in, this is images with laser guided adaptive optics. And what you're seeing in yellow here is the actual full orbit of SO2. 18 years of data. So these flows in this orbit, the very same way if you think about it, that you know, through Kepler's law, through Newton's law, one can estimate the mass of the sun by knowing how fast the planets are moving. You can actually estimate the mass of whatever it is down here, whatever it is that makes SO2 move that fast. Okay? The concept is the same. You need to apply a general relativistic correction. But the point goes back to Einstein. Curved space-time tells masses how to move. So here in full glory, please do focus on the right-hand side here. It's now an artist representation of the very same data that I showed you. The position of, I'm gonna call it the dark mass for now, okay? Sagittarius A star is here. And then those observations have followed and tracked the orbit of SO2 for 18 years. That's the extent of the orbit. The maximum speed of it, when it gets closer to the dark mass, is written down here. 25 million kilometers per hour, or north of 7,000 kilometers per second. The distance okay, between the center of the focus of the ellipse effectively and SO2 is 20 billion kilometers or about 120 times the distance between Earth and the sun, 120 astronomical units, okay. Question? Yeah. So that, that was an astonishing video, the SO2 orbit thing. Um, just to try to orient me a little bit to reality, so is the, the, the pictures you're showing us are, that's not actually visible light, but that would be infrared. far infrared. infrared. Or, yeah, correct, but yeah. Sort of optical radiation. Yes, but, correct. But, but again, Sagittarius A star has been known as a, as a radio source, basically only. So like the fact that it's literally black in the images you're showing is that it is black in everything. It isn't. Longer wavelength. It is not. Than, I will so. show you. What it what Sagittarius A star looks like. Okay. Next. Thank you. Yes. It is extremely faint, however. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if it's going at this speed, which is quite significant, is it getting close to the Roche limit or like where the black hole's gravity would just rip the star? No, 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 not not even remotely so. Okay. It's still mm -hmm. quite far from that. But yeah, it potentially other stars could. <clears throat> so you're you're thinking about a tidal disruption possibility. Yeah, yeah no, it needs to be quite a bit closer. Um, other questions? Yes. So the <clears throat> gravity aberration and the curvature of a black hole is infinite. Why? Yeah. How are we able to measure the densities of them? Right. So some are bigger than others. How do we know that if it's Right. Is, it, um, is it an assumed infinite? So it is, you're correct in that the theory posits the it's infinite curvature within the horizon. So when you approach the singularity, then you achieve infinite curvature as a result of having a large mass within no measurable physical radius. There is no surface. There, hence the infinite curvature. However, everything that we measure 
occurs by definition outside of the event horizon. Where you can measure the curvature, it is not infinite. It is a certain number, it's quantifiable with a, a tensor in general relativity, but the point is at the horizon, the curvature is high, not infinite. Mm -hmm. As you approach the singularity, it approaches infinite. So if that's the case, um, how it, is it safe to assume that a singularity is massless? Um, it gets complicated. <laughs> um, no, no, a black hole carries mass. So the mass reflect the mass tells you the size of the horizon right away. Uh, so if you want to think like you hinted in terms of densities, you know, even though, as I said, it, it, it's not entirely correct because this is not an object that you can approximate as a sphere. It has got no physical radius. But if you want to ask about the equivalent density of, you know, dividing by the horizon, the mass by the horizon of, to the third power, something like that, it actually is counterintuitively, the larger the black hole, the less dense it is. That's because the size of the horizon scales with the mass. So a larger mass has a larger radius. Now, if you divide mass by radius to the third power, it's like dividing mass by mass to the third power, and you have a one over mass to the second power scaling of density. So larger masses mean lower densities, and it gets so mind blowing that, and I, I give that sometimes to the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the advanced uh, undergrads in, in, in the exam, to show that there could, ex in principle, a black hole could exist with the density of water. In principle, a black hole could exist with the density, with the average density of the universe. In principle, we could be living within the event horizon of a black hole without knowing. I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, glass of wine helps. <laughs> All right. So, true. <laughs> so to the left, this is. Also, a recent result, this is again by the Gravity VLT collaboration last year. Again, because of the exquisite precision that they can achieve with the interferometer, they've been able to measure over the time frame between 2002 and 2018, which is about how long it takes for, again, for SO2 to close the orbit. Notice they've been monitor, monitor, monitoring SO2 since the 90s. But the, the instruments became more precise, uh, enabling these measurements only over the last orbit. And this is, you see where I'm going, the, this is an artist's impression of the effect, but it illustrates that they've been able to measure the relativistic precession in the orbit of SO2. So, you know, remember when I talked about Mercury and the fact that one of the earlier tests that the general theory of relativity passed had to do with explaining those 43 arc seconds per century of relativistic precession to do with the fact that elliptical orbits don't close in curved space time. Well, here it is, except this is not the sun. This is a four million solar mass black hole. And this is a star that is 120 astronomical units close to it. So the precession is a stunning 12 arc second for all of it. Uh, have they been able to uh, measure the uh, shrinkage of the orbit due to uh, 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 gra uh, gravitational radiation? No, no, no. That is, I believe it's a, it's a much smaller effect because the mass ratio between the, uh, the black hole and the star 
is very, very large. And therefore, the, the loss of energy due to gravitational wave is um, negligible. I don't even know whether it will be measurable at any point, given that this distance is. Other questions? All right. <laughs> Let's zoom in towards the hole. Okay. So I talked about the dark mass. We are at a point where, as 10 years ago, theories would come up every now and then saying, oh, this is could not could be maybe something like a grava star or some funny solution of the Einstein's equation that would still account for an object with a surface that's not a black hole. I think the community has now agreed that a black hole, such as that object that's right by Einstein, is the most natural explanation for what we are seeing. These latest measurements leave room, if there is anything else within that SO2 orbit, it has to be less massive than 1,000 solar masses. If there is another perturber, some other companion to the black hole, some other dark mass, but the large, you know, four million times the mass of the sun sits right where Sagittarius is. Now, someone asked, what about Sagittarius itself? Does it emit a size your source? Well, this here now is a numerical model. It's a computer simulation, which has in it all the 3D general relativistic effects that you can dream of. Um, as an aside, this simulation was used to program and, uh, and represent the gargantula black hole in the interstellar movie, in case you've seen it, okay? That thing, the realization of the ring was based on actual GR. Uh, so this is showing you, uh, it's a little bit, uh, confusing in the sense that this effect that you're looking at is showing you the possibility for different inclinations with respect to the line of sight. So the idea is that if there is matter around this black hole, and there must be some, if nothing else, because all those stars lose matter through winds, okay, at this point that matters as it's falling towards the black hole becomes really hot, and really fast. And matter that is somewhat dense, hot and fast, emits light. The same as your body emits light. So it's unavoidable that there is emission. Now this prediction with these dark shadow, a kind of um, brighter ring at the center and this disk of matter swirling around it is what you would expect from a black hole. Now I'm going to freeze the simulation in a couple of points, just to... Good. All right, try trust but So imagine when you're seeing a full circle, the idea is that the disk of matter sits in the plane of the board, in the plane of the uh, projector here. Whereas when the disk looks like that and you're seeing a ring, a part of a ring in the back, the disk is oriented edge on, okay? So it's orthogonal to the plane of the board. And what you are seeing in the back is general relativistic aberration of light, bending of light that enables you to see the back of the hole. This is GR. Oh, can we measure this? How big? that thing is, or what can we expect it to be? Uh, well, something at the level of 20 to 30 micro arc seconds, okay? Mm -hmm. By comparison, the full orbit of SO2 was approximately 0.2 arc seconds. So to see the disk of matter around Sagittarius, you need much higher spatial resolution than you can achieve with an interferometer uh, on, on, um, on the VLT. Which brings me to 
the event, event horizon telescope. So again, here we are looking at a movie, sort of an artist impression that is zooming in to the center now of a faraway galaxy named M87. I'll tell you why this is not Sagittarius in a second. You're zooming in the nucleus of a relativistic jet in the radio and seeing this image that I'm sure you have seen. Yes. <laughs> this is now a few years old, actually. This is the first image of the shadow of a black hole. This is a disk of matter around a six billion solar mass black hole that is sitting at the center of a galaxy several millions of years, uh, light years away. Now, back to- Is the difference in color, the uh, uncolored lines, but there's a bright on the bottom and light on top, okay? okay. Now, is, is the top color the close part of the uh, accretion circle and the brighter color the back of the black hole that's accelerated by the gravity coming over the black hole. So the, uh, the difference in light, as you say, is real. It's not an artifact. And um, the idea is that actually the brighter part, the bottom of it, is the one that is closer to us and more importantly is tracing, it's coming from matter, which is um, all of this is moving at close to 20% of the speed of light. So there are significant, not only GR, but Doppler effects that combine with the relativistic effect. And the side, essentially the matter that is rotating, coming towards us, and appears to be brighter. The back uh, of it- Hello, if I may interrupt again. My theory would be that the brighter part would be the rear of the black hole that's accelerated by the black hole, and the darker top part would be the front light that's being slowed down by the black hole behind it. Uh, it's actually the opposite. So everything is accelerated. This is more or less a Keplerian orbit. So the difference in, in brightness uh, um, arises from the relative velocity with respect to the observer. The, the actual rest frame velocity is the same from, for all the matter. All of it is being accelerated uniformly. The one that you're seeing brighter is approaching us, the observer. So the, the size of this um, shadow, you know, he's compared here with the size of the outer solar system and the orbit of where the Voyager 1 should have reached by now, or more or less. But what's in well, the full picture of the galaxy. <laughs> this is the zoom in uh, within 0.001 arc seconds of a relativistic jet that sits at the center of a gigantic uh, radio galaxy. Okay. Now, I want to offer, maybe I'll skip this one, a quick comparison. As you know, there's two images, two of these donuts that have been published. The first one was M87, the one you just saw. And the second one, which was published, was released more recently, is the shadow of Sagittarius A star. Okay. Now, this is as viewed from Earth. So if you were to compare those two images that were published in the plane of the sky as viewed from Earth are about the same, okay? About the same size. So Sagittarius is perhaps slightly bigger. The difference is this guy here is 27,000 light years away, the center of the galaxy. This guy here is 55 million light years away, okay? So 
it goes to even though they they say the size in the plane of the sky is comparable, the actual physical size is not. Black hole in here is much bigger, much larger. So therefore, even if it's at, at a much farther distance, the size of the hole in the plane of the sky will be comparable to Sagittarius A star. So if I now show you sort of the actual physical comparison, so now I'm no longer viewed from Earth, but I pretend to move the M87 black hole to the same distance as Sagittarius, okay, this is the actual difference in size. This is because the Sagittarius black hole is a four million solar mass black hole. The, the M87 one is thought to be six billion solar masses. The size scales linearly with the mass and therefore the M87 shadow is a factor of more than three orders of magnitude larger than Sagittarius. Is size an indicator of age? No, purely of mass. Black holes are actually very simple in terms of the quantities that define them. this mass. There is, there is a um, spin, so the, the fact that they may or not be rotating, that actually does matter. And potentially there is charge, but astrophysically that's irrelevant because it would get neutralized. Oh, I spoiled the next one. <laughs> neutralized over time. Okay. So there's light around the black hole, um, but this black hole is, uh, is it's dormant. It's quiet. It's not accreting, not swallowing matter at any significant. It doesn't even compare to a quasar to the, the source that Martin Schmidt found. And those guys are maybe the same size black holes, but they're swallowing matter at orders of magnet at higher rates. Therefore, they're incredibly luminous. But when they're incredibly luminous because of this accretion process, then you cannot go and do this experiment or look at the stars around them because they, the, 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 the matter that's following in, it's overshining the entire surrounding of the hole. However, we have evidence from large, a large scale image. This is now an X-ray picture of the galaxy taken with the uh, Russian German um, Erosida uh, satellite. We have evidence from these large scale bubbles that are located above and below the center of the galaxy that very likely in the past, something like several few million years ago, several million years ago, the black hole at the center of the galaxy was active, perhaps was a quasar, it was an AGN. And that's what the general thinking nowadays for all black holes. All galaxies have black holes at their center. A lifetime, they undergo a phase of very active accretion and become extremely moments. And this probably was the same for Sagittarius A star. So I'm... Um, uh, can you bear another 10, five, five, 10 minutes? So this is five parts of the scene. Uh -huh. Now we're going into the here. Okay. It is fun. This is, an, again, an actual computer simulation cool. <laughs> that will put you in a spaceship okay, looking at a couple, a pair of black holes that are orbiting each other. And at this point, are losing uh, gravitational energy through uh, gravitational wave emission, and at some point, merging and becoming one. Okay. Now, this looks like science fiction, except we can measure this. Okay. So remember back to the house Taylor pulsar one of the predictions of relativity that was beautifully confirmed with the pulsars has that 
when two compact massive bodies are sufficiently close, where it sufficiently depends on their own mass, they will start to lose orbital energy, therefore shrinking the orbit via sending ripples of gravitational waves through space and time. It is illustrated in this hypnotic movie. So the way, first of all, gravitational waves move at the speed of light. Unlike sound waves, they don't compress matter. You know, you often hear there is no sound in space because there is no medium to compress. Gravitational waves don't need a medium to compress. They distort space-time itself, propagate at the speed of light, and they have a very specific distortion pattern. They zip along at the light, at, at the light speed, and the way that it goes through is written in a stretch space in one direction and squeezes it in the perpendicular direction, then reverses the distortion. Okay. So if you could find a way to measure this pattern, distortions in the fabric of space time as a gravitational wave propagates through Earth you can reconstruct the merger of two black holes out there in the universe. Easy, right? Well, someone has done it. Okay, I'm gonna play this movie, not all of it, just a few, a few minutes. Um, this is, um, was put together by the LIGO collaboration, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory. Fantastic experiment, NSF funded that Shortly after going online in the fall of 2015, detected the first black hole, black hole merger in the universe. So part of the extraordinary science here is enabled by extraordinary technology. The mission of LIGO is to actually search for gravitational waves from cataclysmic astrophysical events, the most energetic and violent events in the universe. So if you can learn things about supernova, about colliding black holes, colliding neutron stars, even the Big Bang, the birth of the universe itself, using gravitational waves in ways that no other type of astronomy can actually see. When you think of observatories, you think of telescopes, someone looking through a telescope out into space, well, our instrument is underground. So we mostly are listening observatory in, in a sense. We are trying to measure something on Earth that's never been measured before. LIGO is an acronym. It stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And what we do here is we use high precision interferometry, laser interferometry, to try and search for gravitational waves that were predicted by Albert Einstein almost 100 years ago, in, actually in 1916. Right? The laser actually is shot out into an interferometer, which is basically a beam splitter, with, uh, which allows the light to be split into two equal powers. One arm of the, the interferometer sends the light out two and a half miles, four kilometers. The other arm sends it also out the same distance. The light bounces around, around about 200 times, comes back, recombines, all right? And the, in that recombination, if there's a gravitational wave, what it will do is it will stretch and compress the arms of the interferometer in a, in a diametrically opposed way. So when a gravitational wave passes over the Earth, this is where it's going to be seen. So they have... two interferometers. One is located in um, Louisiana. The other one is in Washington. They're built the exact same way, two L-shaped arms, each of four kilometers length. And they function the way it was explained by shooting lasers back and forth 200 times, looking for a pattern of that stretch and squeeze from a wave that has a comparable wavelength to the distance between the detectors, so 2,000 miles or so. 
and that will induce a displacement between the arms at the level of one part in 10,000 the size of a proton. Here it is, GW 1509-14, the, the 14th of September, 2015. After the engineering run of the telescope was um, done, they started to listen. And here is a supercomputer simulation of the event that was recorded. Look down here is showing the progression of the signal as it's traveling through the detector, two black holes orbiting around each other, losing energy through gravitational wave emission that were trans, you know, trespassing Earth in September 2015, and then eventually led to this chirp, the very moment when the two black holes merge and become one. So that's the movie. Now, this is the actual data. This is a science plot published by the collaboration shortly thereafter. A plot of, this is the actual signal as recorded by LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston. The data are shown as this kind of ratty, orange and blue pattern and the model for the merger of the black holes in the is the underlying smooth um smooth curve the strain measure here which is the delta lambda the displacement measure for the arms divided by the length of the arms is at the level of 0.5 10 to the minus 20 again, for an arm length of four kilometers. And here's shown is as a function of time, the corresponding relative velocity of the black holes and the relative separation of the black holes, which are getting as fast as, faster than 0.5% of the speed of light and closer than, you know, effectively the, the horizon of the holes. So these were two black holes of 20 and 30 solar masses, which merged into a larger one, releasing an amount of equivalent to two times the sun through ripples in space. Seven years later, this is what LIGO has given us. Every single dot in here is a gravitational wave detection from the mergers of, in blue, two black holes out there, see the mass range, 20, 30, 40 solar masses, leading to a larger hole. And then in orange here are a few, a handful of neutron star, neutron star merger. And they're compared with the range in masses of black holes and neutron stars that we measure electromagnetically. There is a divergence here that we still don't understand why it is that the LIGO black holes are more massive than the electromagnetic black holes. I'm done, basically. As amazing as this is, we're not done. The future is bright for black hole astrophysics. And these are perhaps what I think the, the three most impactful upcoming instrumentation that will peer even further into the physics of black hole. The recently launched, up until the last time I gave a popular talk on black hole, this was always who we launched. Mm -hmm. Finally, it happened on Christmas Day, 2021. The James Webb Space Telescope has launched. It's performing spectacularly, better than specifications. And in, in, it, will, uh, it will yield uh, major discoveries in all areas of astrophysics, but as far as black hole goes, the goal is to see, detect, peak at the baby universe black holes, those that were already in place where the universe was less than half a billion years old, further than Hubble has done. And then, you know, in later towards the 2028 or so, the ELT, the 30 meter class, 
ground-based telescopes will go online. These will enable the same level of studies of stars moving around black holes, other galaxies, which is not achievable with eight meter class telescopes today. And last, this is the most ambitious of them all, European-led, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna wants to essentially take the same concept and similar technology as LIGO in space. This is, you know, a three satellite configuration separated by five million kilometers trailing the Earth in L1 orbit looking for gravitational waves arising not from the mergers of stellar mass black holes, but from the mergers of supermassive black holes like Sagittarius, a star and a 87. So with that, I will close. And I have, just as you have any other question, I have a movie here in the background to play, hopefully, um, that, I could not download and um, add in the presentation, unfortunately. I cannot find it. I'll, I'll start to take questions if you have any, but as I put this movie up. Questions for Elena? Does angular momentum uh, during the merger uh, uh, play any major part in how much energy is released uh, during the merger? Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, does the, uh, the angular spin of the each black hole uh, uh, and, oh. Oh, uh, their, and their orbital energy when yes. they merge, does that um, play a, a significant uh, amount of, uh, uh, of the energy release uh, uh, during the merger? OK, so the, uh, the spin of the black hole, which is effectively yeah, a measure measure of their angular momentum is in, in, recovered by the uh, the waveform. So the moment you actually detect a merger, the separation of those um, of those waves and the and the pattern of the frequency shift enables a measurement not only of the so-called chirp mass, which is a combination of the two masses, but also the spin of the progenitor black holes. Um, in terms of what fraction of the energy, of the rotational energy of the hole is extracted in the form of gravitational waves, uh, I don't think we can separate out whether the energy is coming from the actual rest mass energy of the hole or the rotational energy. However, the final spin of the newly formed black hole can be inferred as well. So uh, it's only a partial answer. I believe, you know, in a 2020 solar mass black hole merger case, the uh, amount of rest mass energy that gets released is at the level of one or two solar masses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe only a small fraction is possibly coming from rotation. Thank you. L1's a Lagrange point, right? Yes. Is that going to get crowded or is that really big? <laughs> yeah. For now, I think it's it's pretty. <laughs> I think Elon Musk can hear me from here. <laughs> that, that's the Earth, Earth Sun L1 point, right? Not not the Earth Moon L, L1 point, right? Yeah. So these are the lasers being activated. So they have to send and stabilize lasers over 5 million kilometers in space. <laughs> and meanwhile, the probes, the gravitational masses in the, in the satellites, those that 
you know, it's, it's the movement of something that needs to be isolated gravitationally from everything else that is happening in the meantime. This, you know, it sounds complete science fiction. However, ESA launched a so-called uh, Pathfinder, LISA Pathfinder mission to test the gravitational isolation technology. They basically had two probes at 40 centimeters of distance, which admittedly is not 5 million kilometers. <laughs> and it worked spectacular. So if this is something you care about to learn, uh, more, please search ESA Lisa Pathfinder. It's stunning. Yes. <laughs> And that is the future. <laughs> and all of that fits in L1? No, L1 was uh, later. Yeah. Can you uh, uh, unpause your screen sharing up there? The yellow. Oh, sorry. I'm very no, sorry. Okay. It was basically showing you last slide. slide. Like as if it was going towards the black. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I think just sharing the whole thing. Would be she'd left it running forever to win a good demo. <laughs> I think you can share your desktop. That should be. Yeah. Okay. I think I've taken a lot of your time. <laughs> Any more questions? Any more questions from the Zoom audience? Let's see, you have some chats up there. Great presentation. I'm still seeing it. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Um, yeah, search is a pathfinder. Yes. Chats is just like. Yeah, I do wonder how over over three million miles they're going to keep that thing lined up at L one. <laughs> yeah, so do I. <laughs> Fortunately, there's no wind out there, but still, <laughs> you have so earthquakes. Many. But it's an engineering problem. It is an engineering problem. I would assume that they're going to be using a technique similar to what they did with gravity probe B, I think it was, where the inertial masses are isolated inside the satellite and the spacecraft itself is tracking those masses and following them. So they're That's staying fixed at the center of mass of the satellite and the satellite is following those masses rather than the whole satellite being affected by solar wind and so on. Yeah, I believe the major challenge is with the lasers, actually. Not that that is a minor one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> so as a little token of our appreciation we'd like to give you a club t-shirt okay. or a baseball style hat if you'd prefer uh i'll put, I'll put the hat on okay. it doesn't have this pattern on it it's got you see an example there and there oh, and there's yeah. two different types there's a higher profile which i think is both of those and that's got the, I think, elastic on the back? Uh, yeah. Okay. It's kind of a stretchy. Yeah. And then there's another type that's sort of a flop. You're a little low profile, and it's got an adjustable band on the back. Oh. Um, Is that like Dave's? Oh, uh, no, the, yeah. the Michigan. Yeah. Okay, but it's more Dave's style. Yeah. 
Oh, it's yeah, it's a little more of that style. Joyce, so I think I'll be sorry. <laughs> 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 You'd send me a shipping address then. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'll, give you um, I'll send it to you via email. Yeah. 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 Of course. Uh, and I think there's two sizes on those. Like a small, medium. When you send me the email, I'll find out okay, how to send it. Sure. We'll figure you. that out. Someone in the family will use it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sorry, I think it was a little too long. Oh, no problem. <laughs> we enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You said lights on? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So as far as uh, the business part of the meeting, I was going to talk about the open house uh, tomorrow and, well, I guess the next one. I'm not going to be able to attend either one of those as I had sent out my email. So, and then I got very concerned because we had Jack and then just two other people that was willing to help tomorrow night. And that would have been kind of tricky for him. However, just since I sent that email, Adrian, Bradley has said that he can be the open house coordinator and uh, and who was it? Uh, John Wallbank said that he could be greeter. So I think with that, we should just go ahead and do it. So I think that'd be enough people. So I'll go ahead and send the uh, announcements out and all that stuff tonight and, be, and have it done. So open house tomorrow is a go. With that, just watch the weather go to hell. <laughs> I'll be available to help too. Thank you very much. What's your name? Pete. Pete. Uh, you sent me the email, right? About okay, got you, Pete. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, and then next Saturday, I guess uh, we don't know. Same thing. We'll try to get some help, depending on the weather, of course, whether we do that one or not. So, and one other thing, the Student Astronomical Society, uh, in earlier couple months ago, was talking about doing an event up there. Problem was, we couldn't really find a date, like in the middle of the week, that we could get help to do it. So. They said that they could piggyback on an open house. They weren't sure which one, and now they've decided they would like to do this one, and there's going to be about 10 of them. I was kind of hoping that maybe we could do a special little thing for them, like a little tour or something like that. I don't know if that's really going to be able to happen or not. But anyway, approximately 10 of these people will probably all be arriving. Maybe they even get a bus. I don't know. It's like a van thing. I'm not sure. But uh, they'll be from our partners here at the U of M in a sense, the Student Astronomical Society. So, uh, well, let's let that bus driver know about the trip up the mountain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure. Usually we do the thing for the Michigan Math and Science Scholars. They get a couple of vans and bring people up. That'd be it, what I'd expect. Yeah, so that's probably the same deal this time, but I, I'm not sure. So These are club vans with like... 10 to 15 passenger capacity. Right. Make, yeah. They they won't yeah. have a problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they'll be okay, especially since the road is rezoned. So uh the only other thing I'm concerned about is we've got to start working on uh speakers because we have a speaker for next month and then December. And you might have noticed Fred Sheever sent out a notice about the artsy meaningless slideshow and looking for pictures. Uh, several people probably in the Zoom audience, some people in this room have never seen an artsy, meaningless slideshow. You do not want to miss this. We see it. We do it every few years so we can kind of gather up new pictures and things. And, and Fred Schieber puts a lot of work into it. It's not like he's got the energy to do it all the time. But I would say every three, four years, something like that, we do one of these. And it is very cool. It's not just a slideshow. It's all set to music and and for anybody that's been in the club for a while, it's actually kind of emotional, really, to watch this and see all this history and things that you remember and have been through. And for new people or newer people, it kind of gives you a little even more flavor of what the club is like and some of the things that we've done and what you've already seen. So highly, highly recommended. Uh, anyway, that's coming up in December. And then I got Brother Guy. Uh, if you don't know, he's the director, the top guy for the Vatican uh, Observatory. 
And uh, I got him to do a talk for us a few years ago. And next thing you know, I got a repeat appearance. And the next thing you know, he said, hey, I really like this group. Why don't you make me a regular speaker? Why well, he didn't have to say that twice to me. <laughs> so every few years, we've had the honor of having him back here. And as you're going to notice, I guess, for the new people, we actually get some really high-level speakers. I mean, world-famous people, and he's one of them. So uh, again, January, you don't want to miss that. He was a little bit tentative, uh, but it was more so whether he can do this in person or would end up having to do a, a, a remote session. Usually we've had him live. I think the last time that couldn't work out and we had to do a remote. And uh, so he kind of rubbed it in because it was in the winter and he was in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so what, what month is? That's January. And after that, we've got nobody. So I'm getting lower because January will be here like two blinks of the eye. So Fred's December, what was November? Uh, November is a guy named Neil Cornish, I believe. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. one of our members, I'm trying to think of his name right now, I think in Montana, saw him at the University of, or Montana State University, and kind of did like what Dave and I used to do at Saturday Morning Physics and said, hey, you'd be a good speaker for our club. Mm -hmm. And he said he expressed some interest, so he turned them over to me, and I and I signed them up. So so that will be a remote session, being he's a little ways away. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's Neil Corner, if I remember right. So uh, so anyway, we got to work on that. It'd be kind of embarrassing to run out of speakers, and just have one of us up here droning away or something. Nobody show up. Uh, so anyway, moving on to other officers, Jim, you have anything to report? Uh, not a lot. Um, Adrian's supposed to come by my place tomorrow afternoon about 5.30 to pick up my set of keys so he can open up tomorrow night. Uh, so, you know, he'll send out a, a, a text or an email or whatever um, when he actually has the keys to give people an idea of when they can uh, get up the hill, um, but since sunset is a quarter, about quarter to seven, um, that gives you an idea of when you should be able to get in. I don't know when Jack is planning to be there. Um, I would imagine it'd be about the same time. Yeah. We'll hear from Jack in a minute, so <laughs> that's yeah, what I'm I was thinking, so. Still going through the after effects of the evil virus, so I won't be there, um, <clears throat> which is unfortunate, but that's kind of the way it goes. So I don't advise anyone getting this and um, taking all the precautions you can to avoid it. Yeah, I seem to be one of those rare people that it has not caught up with yet. Unless yeah. I did, it was totally asymptomatic, but at my age, I don't know what the chances of that would be. Well, if you're totally so asymptomatic, or... you were, a, you know, a typhoid Mary just spreading it around, and shame on you, Charlie. Well, actually, <laughs> I had somebody suggest that, and I said, yeah, but the only problem with that is then it seems like people I were around would report they got COVID, and that's never happened. In wow. fact, it's been exposures I've had, and I didn't get it, so... Yeah. Well, so I, 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 thought, I thought about that, and I can't see that happening. Black hole, something okay. like that. Yeah. Well, that they think there are a few people that somehow are genetically immune, and they don't understand why. And maybe I'm one of them. Yeah, but, you ought to turn yourself in to be. Well, uh, that's what I'm afraid of. Here they are right now. <laughs> yeah, anyway, the, pro good that's, right. all, that's I'll probably get it next week or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, Charlie, your ancestors probably survived the plague too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ain't, ain't no joke. My wife, uh, I had it, and she tested negative the entire time. It was from yeah, isn't it weird? <laughs> yeah. yeah so it was there was an inquiry about the ACNO list that I answered, and there's been some disagreement about it. Um, my feeling is there's too many non-members on the ACNO list to use it as it is. Um, people we don't know and have no idea how they will respond to our uh, virus protocols. And so I just assume it'd be left dormant or purged of uh, non-members, um, you know, rather than 
you know, fired up as the list as it exists. That's my opinion. Yeah, we kind of discussed or started discussion email wise on that, but not everybody's chimed in, including me. So to be honest, I haven't had a lot of time to think about that, but I see your point, really. Well, we, I was involved in a little bit of that, and Jeff Gopman said something about it. it's still active and he's still adding people to it when they ask for it, but uh, he didn't say anything about it. Jeff, you can answer for yourself, but he didn't say anything about it being inactive. And if you send something to it, I think it's going to go out. That's my understanding of what Jeff yeah. last said. Yeah. Right. That's, that's correct. Yeah, just since uh, John Causland's passing, we really haven't been using it. So but nobody deactivated it. Yeah, so yeah, I, that's I understand that the members can still use it, but I really hesitate to respond to it if I know that there's people on it that are non-members. Yeah, maybe at least in the shorter term, that's the better way to do it. Well, yeah. yeah, just rebuild it yeah. as we need. So you can just uh, purge non members if you want. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Those people who are on it are already on it. That's true. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Well, most all of the people that I met at John's house, um, you know, his neighbors and friends and whatnot, they all seem to me to be pretty reasonable people, but you know, there were also people I met at John's house that didn't seem to have their feet on the ground. So I, I'm really hesitant to leave all of them on the list. So got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Anything else, Jim? Um, no, I had a great time at Okie Techs. Uh, oh, cool. You know, the um, obviously I got sick from attending it. The showers there are pretty cramped, and I'm pretty sure that's how I, I got sick is being in there with uh, a lot of uh, other fellows that were, you know, scraping off the desert and. <laughs> in close quarters so the next year uh the group of us that went this year are going to be um staying at the state park and setting our equipment up at the at the star party and you know doing all of our sleeping and domestic chores um off the site um, and hopefully we'll be able to better protect ourselves from um, public health problems. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I don't think I see Adrian, do I? He's on Belle Isle. He said he was going to try and chime in remotely, but... Uh, yeah, I, I didn't I don't see him there, though, so... There's some sort of outreach event at Belle Isle. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but that's where he is. And I didn't see he Brian. Gets, uh, a light pollution uh, check uh, out there, because there was something from uh, Sally uh, mentioning uh, 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 a light pollution type uh, check at uh, Belle Isle. Yeah, I like what they're doing on Bell Isle. It's very sick. Dave, do we need a mic? Or? No, I have no mic. Oh, okay. So we have been thinking a little bit about speakers. There's a Elena Adams, who's a mission system engineer for the DARP mission. That's the mission where the spacecraft colliding with an asteroid to see if they change the orbit. Um, the name sounded familiar, and I realized that she was a um, PhD student here about 17 years ago, spoke to the club. I haven't been able to get a hold of her, but I did get a thing to Jamal. 
I was able to um, get her email address. So. Um, there's some other possibilities we can just try to run down. Um, if you can't get a hold of her that way, I do know one person who is working with the DART mission. Oh, okay. And so um, if you can't get a hold of her, send the um, name of her to me. And okay. I, What's your name? Uh, Dimitri, D-M-I-T-R-I. -I. Yeah, sometimes it helps to have somebody actually at John Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, Thanks. appreciate it. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, I think we probably should touch base with uh, Buddy Stark. He's the new um, planetarium director at the U of M Museum. Um, what I was thinking is we could actually physically have a meeting over at the planetarium. People that want to show up can be there. We can Zoom in. Bring yeah, people sure. down. But mm -hmm. he's probably agreeable to that. Probably got the facilities new enough that they might have you know, Zoom abilities too. I don't think so. Well, I know that they're I mean, certainly the presenter, if nothing else. Right? I mean, well, it was about, I think it was about a year ago. You know, <laughs> Buddy did a Zoom thing. I wasn't there, but I was able to watch it on Zoom. So I'm pretty sure they're able to do it. Must be. Yeah. yeah. We haven't been there for a little while, so that would be cool. Probably. And Norbert's invited us to the yeah. planetarium at Eastern. Right. So yeah, between that and the uh, U of M one, we haven't really been in a planetarium for a while now. Yeah. So and, and <laughs> yeah, it's especially nice in the winter when you can't see the sky anyway. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Better, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Jack. Um, I plan on opening the observatory tomorrow night. <laughs> Assuming from the weather, it looks like things should work out okay. Uh, the other thing is, um, do you know what time Adrian was going to be at the observatory? I mean, at the front gate or when it was going to open up? Well, I know what he told me, but then there's what he'll actually accomplish. <laughs> so I don't think he said in the email. But you, but. You know, you have your own keys to get in, and um, but hopefully he'll be there before the public starts showing up. But I would lock the gate behind you if you're worried about it. Okay, because I'll probably get up there around 6.30 then, just to open up the observatory and everything. Okay, well, I, I told him that it... it for him to be really prepared that he should be up there by six o'clock. He's supposed to come by my house at 5.30. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, he's going to beat you there now, Jack. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's, I, you know, it gets dark by seven. I mean, it's, yeah. Seven. Yeah, it's, it's it, it, it'll right. be getting dark quickly once the sun sets. And so, yeah. We, okay. I, mean, I think Adrian understands that. He's just got a full day tomorrow. Right. Okay. Other than that, uh, I was at the observatory the last time a couple of weeks, where everything seemed to be working okay. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, with clear skies, uh, things should work out okay. And the yeah, issue sure. at uh, Belle Isle is that Belle Isle Nature Center has reopened. This was their reopening week, reopening day mm -hmm. kind of project. And they are trying to make that what they call an urban dark sky center. So they've been getting some groups from the Wayne State Planetarium and some other local people uh, to bring telescopes, do some astronomy out there and things like that. So that's what they're going to do tonight. Uh, uh, Jack, you're, just tell me when you're going to be there. I can be there to meet you when we can get the, uh, you know, the traffic cones out of the, uh, the observatory and get things set up. Okay, then let's make it at 6.15. Good. I'll be there. Early, I think you should go 6.17. <laughs> I guess if you square that by a number divided by two, maybe it would be 6.15.05. Oh, anyway, yeah, I'll see you there at 6.15. I'll be there. there at the front gate, and then we'll go in from there and take care of it. Okay, I'll be there. Um... That's all I have for right now. I oh, 
And I will not be at the October 29th meeting. Uh, the manner I, I won't be able to make it. So um, I, I think Adrian sent back an email that he was going to open up the observatory on the 29th. I think I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that'll be. And hopefully next weekend I'll be available. Okay. That would be oh, good to yeah. yeah. No, that's good. That's good. That's all I have for right now. Okay. Thank you, Chad. Jeff? Uh, let me check the final things. We had a maximum of 33 tonight, uh, 21 Zoom, and 12 uh, in person. Mm -hmm. In person, the numbers are looking good. Um, yeah. I will say uh, I came across, it was in Sky and Telescope, I think it was November, but they had this marvelous book called Astro Quizzical by Jillian Scudder. And I've been going through it, and it's kind of like a, you can look at it afterwards, but it's kind of like very small top, uh, topics, maybe a page or two of text, and explanations of everything from solar systems to galaxies to whatever, as a general introduction or uh, even uh, a primer to send to somebody. Uh, it's a really great little book, and I, I was impressed with it. But it's like 30 bucks, and it's only a hard cover, but worth every penny. <clears throat> but I'll make his bill for people to look at afterwards. And that's about it. I'm still working at website uh, stuff. I haven't gotten time, but November, December is starting to clear up. So I think we'll get moving on that soon. Okay. Uh oh, um, I have one thing I forgot to mention. And this is for those of you that are here. Uh, uh -huh. and you probably know. Over the last couple of years ago, we've been handing out these red ruby lift plastic uh, sheet. A lot of people put them over their screens on their computers or they'll cut out the surface for them to make uh, red light flashlights, things like that. And uh, by the way, the interesting thing is uh, these are still at the pre inflation, pre recession price of one dollar a piece you can't get them emailed if you wanted to for that price so if anybody would like one they're only a dollar today only put them on your computer in the front or like i said cut out parts for your flashlights or you got a light or a helmet or windows part you want to cover they're really nice and they're, they're, they're not the real thin you'll see they're thicker they're not mm -hmm. the real real thin plastics so well, they do work well on laptops. I can, I can yeah, yeah. Well, if anybody wants them, you know, that's all I have to say. I got help. Thank you, Jack. You're too much to serve. <laughs> I believe I see Amy in the Zoom audience. Yep. Hi there. Um, no report. Nothing that I can think of. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Great newsletter as always. Thank you. That leaves us with the guy with our money, Doug. <laughs> oh, that guy. Yeah. Guy that barely goes up to meetings. Um, <laughs> I can't remember the last one I was at. Um, we've had some family issues to deal with, and I've been out of state for quite a bit. So anyway, I apologize for that. So I don't know how far back to go other than I'll just give you a present thing. Um, one of the things us uh, officers talked about was uh, stopping carrying along some memberships that were uh, due to COVID co considerations, we were just sort of carrying along. So I've taken care of notifying all those people about half renewed and about half didn't. So our new up to date, accurate number now is 192 memberships, which is still pretty cool. good. Um, we're up over around 200, but uh, uh, 192 isn't anything to sneeze at. Um, we've got uh, almost thirteen thousand dollars in the treasury. Um, we got to buy something. <laughs> we got to buy it. Yeah, we got to spend something. Um, Winter's coming. Yeah. And part of that, part of that is a uh, hundred dollars. We got a, a thank you gift from Westland uh, Library for whatever presentation we did recently for them. Did we do it yet, or did we? Are we yet to do it? Yeah. I don't even know. Tom and I did that a couple of weeks ago. Okay. 
So hundred dollars there. Uh, other than our usual expenses, I've uh, the observatory and the 17 and a half inch and two track repair at the observatory that all amounted to almost $300. So I've spent that. Um, the other sort of major thing to talk about is the RASC uh, calendars and handbooks. So we've always, as long as I've been treasurer and before, I believe we always ordered from RASC themselves. Um, and last year was such a mess as far as getting invoices, getting them delivered, getting, you know, it was just a big, it was a big hassle. So Astronomical League offered, uh, and forgive me if I'm boring you with this, if you've already heard it, but uh, they offered to pre-order um, at a good price, um, a number of, of each. So we decided to go through them. So I pre-ordered uh, 20 of each. And just like in the past, you have to send me money if you want to be on the uh, reserved list. I have it. And a number of you have. A couple of you officers, at least one I can think of, um, mentioned, yes, reserve one for me, but I haven't gotten money yet. So until I have money, um, you're really not reserved to have one. Um, but the total was uh, $880 for 20 handbooks, 20 calendars. Handbooks are costing you $26 each, um, $18 for a calendar, which is, you know, I stopped doing the um, uh, check up the price a little bit as a fundraiser. We have more than enough money. We don't need to do that anymore. Um, so a number of you have sent it in and let's see, I've got still eight handbooks available and nine calendars available. So get your money in early enough and once they're all reserved and I have money that you know that's it there won't be any more um, how long have so, we got though? what's that how long have we got you got until uh until I run out of reservations they're going to send us 20 of each so it's not like there's a deadline gotcha. the deadline is when I receive 20 reserve you know payment for 20 calendars and payment for 20 handbooks, that's when it gets cut off. So um, when they're gone, they're gone. And if we have extra left over, we can, I don't know, give them to members, offer them to uh, uh, guest speakers, who knows what. Um, and that's my report. Although I have one more, two more things. Uh, Alina, she wanted a cap. Yes, the did high profile. She, the high profile, did she mention which size, the larger one or no, the small No, I couldn't one? remember. Is it a small, medium, and then a medium, or how, what the two so sizes? Small, like? mediums, and then there's large, extra large. And so if you just communicate with her with email, just make sure yeah. you copy me, and then I can right. uh, make sure I get her thing, oh. get the right mailing address and all that. I guess it'll be the smaller one, but we'll find out for sure. Yeah. And then one last thing, John Wallbank, what happened to your beard? <laughs> Whoa! What? That's masks. It was wearing, pretty... wearing masks in hospitals and doctors. Oh, bodies. okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. It's for for that reason. I, think, I uh, guess I didn't Curtis, look there fully enough to be fair. <laughs> I didn't either. Like Curtis making up. I still little. recognized you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it says John Wall Wallbank at the bottom. So well, that's true too. Maybe I gave it away. <laughs> so yeah. Um. Uh, don't see anything else in my notes, so that's my report. Okay. If I missed any officers, let me know. I think I got everybody that's present. Uh, otherwise, does anybody have anything else you'd like to bring up? I do. Um, uh, cleaning my apartment or attempting to do so, I came across uh, the uh, video, uh, the VHS cassette of the uh, low row. Uh, uh, interviewed down at CTN a few years back, and uh, I went to the U of M uh, Ramwood facility and copied it on the DVD. So uh, uh, it was doing it like uh, a half hour, but uh, I still got to trim off a little bit of the uh, end because it looked like there was something else on that tape also uh, that got. That's still on the uh, on the end, but the whole interview should be on that. And uh, I didn't know if anyone wanted uh, to either borrow it, or 
do I make multiple copies or what? Should have had that on the whole time. <laughs> Would it be possible to put that up on YouTube? Well, that'd be interesting. If I may recommend, with my experience with um, YouTube, if you're uploading the direct DVD file, it's like 480 pixels by 640, it's going to come out looking terrible. So it might be better to like take the DVD and then upscale it to 1080 or just scale it up to 1080 and then upload it. That's my recommendation. <laughs> Sense. Yeah. yeah, it was a, it was a while ago. But... We'll see, will CTN uh, uh, allow us to put uh, uh, something uh, up uh, that they was originally done for the studio? Yeah, actually, they care. Depends on the copyright, I guess. No. <laughs> I know he made a few copies of it. It gave one to Red, but I would expect the copyright would be owned by the people being interviewed and not by the studio in which they were interviewed. Well, then we don't have a problem. Well, it should be no problem. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Since two of us are in the room. <laughs> Charlie, I do have one more thing to add. I forgot to mention um, about the calendars and handbooks. Um, they will be delivered allegedly in December. And instead of Liz Calhoun distributing, it will be Jim Forrester who graciously offered to do that. He lives a block or two away from Liz. So if you could get to Liz's place, you should be able to get to Jim's place. And uh, you could arrange things with him. But that those announcements will come once we get closer to delivery. Appreciate you both for doing it. Anything else? I, I see Kurt ask about updating oh, the yes. website password. Yeah. With uh, membership. Do we haven't done it for a while. It was Kathy asked, I think, yeah. Yeah, Kathy did, sorry. Ooh. <clears throat> yeah, it's... I guess I'm in favor of that. I don't know who would actually carry it out. What we should do first is get up. I, I should get up to date uh, versions of the list so that I can reconcile them against our membership database since I can't get in there and make any changes. And then I can make sure they're all, you know, one to one and, um, and then we could change it. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, my apologies. I didn't get to those on Monday. Uh, we were still yeah. the issues. So. Well, I didn't have time to look at them anyway, so. <laughs> you know, I'll get to them this weekend. So, Jeff, it's this yeah. clunky uh, HD access thing, which is the best word. That's why I said, <laughs> oh, Christmas thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was it Christian that did it last week? I can't read. I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. He's the yeah. only one that, that is yeah. in the AFS regularly. I okay. The United changed it years ago. Yeah, quite yeah. a while ago. Yeah, I'm sure I could figure it out. But, but. Yeah. Anything else? In that case, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Support. 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 Anybody opposed? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hey, y'all. Thanks for coming. Have a good night. You too. I would like one of your. I think I've got a question. You can take action.